For months, America's health has been under attack. We have to do what it takes now to end this sooner. A battle against an invisible threat. This week, we shine light on health care in the age of coronavirus. This is Austin, Indiana. We'll tell you about the outbreak that happened here years ago. Doctors say prepared them for this pandemic. We're looking at the strain on the system, the stories of those stepping up, and what needs to be done moving forward across America. This is The Race. Welcome to The Race, I'm Chris Stewart. This pandemic has impacted our lives for months, no matter where you live. But here in Austin, Indiana, they're using the experience from a medical crisis that no community wants to face to move forward. For many of us, this word has taken a more personal meaning this year. For those in Austin, Indiana, it's not the first time. You know, we're a little bitty town and you have, you know, a big city problem. By 2015, the opioid crisis had ravaged Ethan Howard's hometown for years. Opiates were my, were my devil. The same syringes were often passed from person to person. What we saw was uh, a, a really quick and dramatic rise in hepatitis C around that time. Dr. William Cook was the town's only doctor. Any community that has a high hepatitis C rate is also at risk of an HIV outbreak. He said, you tested positive for the antibody. Ethan was HIV positive. I thought I was dead. I thought it was a death sentence. And he wasn't alone. That first year, um, we, we had almost 200 new cases. It, it represented um, something like a, a quarter of the, the HIV cases in the state. And this is a, a town of 4,200 people. Tiny Austin became home to one of the largest HIV outbreaks in rural America ever. Dr. Cook helped convince then Governor Mike Pence to change his stance on needle exchanges. It's a very serious situation. It took a few months, um, but eventually he did sign the executive order allowing us to be able to operate uh, syringe service programs here. That program, access to addiction recovery services and powerful HIV medicine has led to a dramatic drop in new cases. Medications today are, are powerful enough and well tolerated enough that you should not spread the disease to anybody else and you should not never worry about dying of HIV. If I was given the choice between having diabetes and HIV, I would choose HIV in a heartbeat. We first spoke with Dr. Cook in early 2020. Then the pandemic set in. I have been doing all the corona testing at the, at the office. Even though nurse Jessica Howard says she hasn't seen coronavirus cases in large numbers here. Let me see what door is open. Her help goes beyond medicine. She's making sure people have the food, clothing, and help they need to make it through. She's worried her patients battling addiction and quarantine could relapse. These are our people and we have to take care of them and we have to protect them. It's this kind of response beyond just medicine, helping now like it did during the HIV outbreak of 2015. Fought and clawed my way out of a really dark place and a lot of people, I proved a lot of people wrong. And I feel good long way. We've been through a healthcare disaster before and that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. A mindset Dr. Cook says we need now as we all fight this new outbreak. Experts say this pandemic has been making access to healthcare in rural communities worse. More than 125 rural hospitals have shut down in the last decade. Rural Americans are more likely to report being in poor health compared to people in cities and suburbs. This is according to a report from the nonpartisan Trans America Center for Health Studies. The report says rural Americans don't see the doctor as often 
are more likely to struggle to pay medical bills, and they are also offered fewer health care benefits through work. People in urban areas are almost twice as likely to have insurance compared to those in rural communities. Experts say employers in rural America should maximize benefits for employees and create strong wellness programs to promote a health conscious culture. The report wants lawmakers to look closer at where federally funded facilities are and what incentives could encourage doctors to work in those areas. Systemic racism is having an impact on America's health care system, and Alexa Liaco spoke to a doctor who's working to change that. No justice, no peace. Racism makes all of us sick. It's an issue pumping through our nation's veins. It exposed long existing ones and exacerbated them and made them worse. Unequal access to care and unequal risk of infection based on the color of your skin. African Americans have lower access to every single health care service in this country except amputation. Like, just think about that. She says the first issue minorities have, especially during the pandemic, less access to affordable insurance and medical care. More than half of black folks in this country have lost their jobs as a result of COVID-19. Together with undocumented populations who don't have readily available, affordable access to health care. Dr. Boyd says that disparity also exists in mortality rates. African Americans between 35 and 44 years old are nine times more likely to die from COVID-19 than white adults the same age. She says higher minority mortality rates can come from a list of reasons. One of the most important, access to clean water. But we know African American and Latinx households have two times the likelihood of having unclean water in their home as white households. And Native American households are 19 times less likely to have clean water than white households. At a time when hand washing is the most profound and simple public health intervention, we have a disproportionate distribution of clean water. Boyd says protection on the job is another reason more minorities are ending up in the ER with COVID-19. Essential workers tended to be folks of color and particularly women of color and because they didn't have in their industries access to adequate PPE, their work then became a source of exposure to COVID for many. Boyd says the worst infection is discrimination. The stress of insecurity, of not knowing where your next paycheck might come from or where your next meal might come from, or if your family is safe when they leave your home. All of those things are increased threats that folks of color have faced in this country for a while that increases the circulation of harmful hormones like cortisol that actually make people sick. In the long term, she believes universal health care and more help from employers to protect their employees can even the playing field for minority communities. Because we could be doing better than we are, and so we need to. For The Race, I'm Alexa Liaco. Experts say racial bias affects health far beyond coronavirus. Numbers show that black people die from cancer more often than white people and have higher rates of diabetes. Black mothers are also more likely to die during childbirth than white mothers. Experts are also studying racism in medical care. Researchers have found racial biases in health algorithms and common diagnostic tools, including the spirometer used to measure lung capacity. Several cities and counties have declared racism a public health emergency. Leaders and advocates say classifying racism that way opens new opportunities for finding solutions and creating change. When this pandemic started, Congress required insurance companies to cover the cost of COVID testing and any related care. But as Chris Conti found, some survivors are still getting some expensive bills. As long as I have a mask, I'm okay. I can breathe. Armed with nothing but a cell phone. This is the eloquence that I have to take for six months. Janet Mendes um, took us just... inside the world of a woman recovering from COVID. The first couple of days, I didn't know who I was. This New York City resident first started feeling sick on March 25th. Eventually, she ended up in the ER. This 33-year-old's lungs were failing. I couldn't breathe even with the oxygen mask. They, were, they put the oxygen, oxygen mask um, the, to 100% and I was only breathing at 70% level. It was April 13th by the time she was sent home from the hospital, a full two weeks and five days in intensive care. 
that's supposedly the last bill that I received. She returned home to her studio apartment only to be hit with another COVID side effect, the bills. I was like, oh my God, when would I finish paying? Her bills totaled more than a half a million dollars. Janet has insurance, but the hospital didn't input her policy number at first. They have since frozen her accounts and are reviewing what happened, but she still owes more than 75 grand. How am I going to pay for it? How is this going to set me back with my other bills? What's happening to Janet is happening to countless other COVID patients across the country. By law, COVID testing and procedures are supposed to be covered, but Americans are realizing that unless they push back against their insurance companies, they're stuck with astronomical surprise bills. Do you think the system's broken? Of course. Janet's also concerned about her friends and neighbors who don't speak English and may not know their rights. This is happening to me. How many other people that oh, don't speak the language or don't have the education level to understand what's going on or have no other capacity, then be like, oh my God, this is the bills. But no, there's help. You have to make the noise. It can't be just me. It has to be more people. Speak up. Accountability so that patients aren't suffering more than they already have. For The Race, I'm Chris Conti reporting. Doctors are under intense pressure as they treat coronavirus patients. The help they're getting so they can keep doing their jobs to the best of their abilities, next.